Next, let's look at regionalism in the South Korean job market. This is from 1990, so it's rather old, apparently. Um, the only thing I can find about gelato, actually, is there's very little in English. This is an analysis of regional origin inequality among migrants in Seoul. So we looked at some gender stratification. Now, what's happening within Korea as it industrializes? And Korea, of course, was mentioned within Chang's article. So this is a focus uh, of a bit more detail within one of those countries where we are now. It says regionalism in the South Korean job market. Let me make it larger so we can read along if you don't have a printed copy. As Korean society underwent a marked transformation in its industrial and urban structure during the 1970s, under governmental policies designed to achieve maximum economic growth, annual GDP growth rate averaged nearly 10% between 1970 and 1980. The per capita GDP increased from $234 in 1970 to over $1,481 in 1980. It doesn't sound like much, but Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world immediately after World War II. It was comparable to where Papua New Guinea is right now. In 1970, manufacturing employment was 14% of the nation's workforce, but in 1980, it was 22%. In the meantime, the number of workers outside agriculture, all the rural occupations, increased from 50 to 62%, and the urban population became dominant during that period as well. What about education, mass education? By 1980, the illiteracy rate for the population between ages 6 and 16 had almost been wiped out. There was nobody who could not read. It's a very amazing thing. It doesn't happen very often in this part of society. It really doesn't. But a lot of countries with huge gender differences uh, within education particularly. In that year, only 7% of the population did not receive any formal education. Moving on, during this time, Seoul received most of the benefits. The nation's banking, financial, and corporate headquarters are located here, as are 40% of the nation's white-collar jobs. And we looked at white-collar jobs a minute ago, going back to chain. Here's white-collar jobs over here. So typically coded as masculine in most societies. Very masculine right here within Korea. Three quarters of the nation's commercial transactions took place in Seoul. So Seoul was called, and still is called, the Republic of Seoul yeah, as an epithet or a criticism of the centralization of power here. But what's going on with different regions? You know, different regions had different histories, right? Many different people came from many different areas. And I showed you, historically, uh, the provinces that historically had different cultures, Shila, Kaya, Pekche, Uburu, and they would have a different structure, moving all moving to Seoul, all hoping to enter into the same hierarchies of stratification with equal competition. But equal competition didn't happen. And not only in gender, you saw the gender differences, but space, where you came from, became very important for what job you went into. Just like we saw earlier for index of assimilation, assimilarity and index of dissimilarity, there's, an in, there's a similarity of certain regions associated with certain jobs, particularly Gyeongsang provinces. Gyeongsang areas made up a huge disproportionate amount of people in the professional areas, whereas people from Jolado made up a large disproportional amount of people moving into the lower status occupations. Why? You may say, well, you could look at the history of the Chosun dynasty. I've already talked about it. And they talk about that here. But also, you can say, you can think about this on the level of individuals. We've talked about human capital. We've talked about you know, cultural capital. We've talked about, we've talked about economic capital, obviously class. And sexual capital, four levels of individual capital where people move into a hierarchy using these. 
If you're historically coming from gelato, you would have very low levels of many of these to participate. And also, it's a culture that values itself. Well, from what I've read about ethnography, these people are, they're happy being this way. So you would not necessarily see them to be the most competitive and individualistic uh, groups. So different regions and different cultures over time. Let's look at some of the charts just to summarize what was happening. First, some data about the scale of migration. So Seoul was nothing, and then it was all migrants. So you could argue that there was nothing previously there except people's ideas of who should be in the hierarchies and who should not. On page 25, that's 26. On page 25, the first full paragraph. So Seoul is thus a city of migrants. In, eight, uh, in 1990, of the 8.4 million people residing there in eight, 1980, 58% were lifetime migrants. Among adult residents, migrants consulted 80% of the population. It's a whole city of migrants. The percentage of lifetime migrants increased for all ages between this period. The five-year migrants who arrived between 1975 to 1980 consult, constituted 15% of the city's total residents in 1980. So, you know, all the people that came in these first five years were just 15% of all the people once 1980 arrived. Between 1975 and 1980, one and one quarter million people migrated to Seoul from other parts of the country. 54% were females. Hello, 54, you know, it's not males going, but females leaving and working. And 46% were males. This happens right now in the Philippines. Agricultural work is typically coded as male. So when females leave, they can send, they're seen as superfluous. They're seen as secondary to the rural economy. So they work and they send money back to the rural areas. So it's interesting that it's not males going to work in Seoul. Majority, they're females. It says some moved in from other cities, but the majority came from rural areas. And here's the, you know, 25% from nearby Gyeonggi, that's around Seoul. 26% from central region, Kangwon, Cheonggul, Cheongnam. 27% uh, from Honam, Joado region, and 19% uh, from Gyeongsang area, near Busan. So the smallest amount left the Busan area, with had traditionally a bigger city there, had its own professional class. But from all other rural areas, you had a large amount of people moving to Seoul. But as the data shows, these people, this small percentage, ended up in the management positions. They re replicated themselves as top of the hierarchy. And despite most people being thrown together, they reorganized on historical hierarchies <coughs> of regions. And people from Tolado, whether by individual capital or whether by historical environmental racism, really, whether by either they were relegated to the lower underclass jobs within Seoul, more than other groups. This is not a stratification that is complete. It's not entirely based on that, but it's a similar argument about association and dissimilarity, that some jobs tended to have many more people from Gelato, and some jobs tended to have many more people from the area around Gyeongsang. Let me show you a few charts. Here's the history uh, first described on the top of page 26, if you don't know. It says, although regionalism is widely recognized as a powerful social force in Korea that has dictated social, economic, and political lives of so many people, many people ignore it. That's why we're talking about it. Sociology cannot have major taboos, I think. I think you need to talk about the existence of power structures, particularly the side ones. And regional stereotypes are still strong, I think, in many people's minds. Whether, not this generation, but historically the people
came into Seoul in the 1970s would have these. Regionalism in Korea is thought to have its origin in the Three Kingdom era. I showed you a picture. Of, oops, I showed you a picture of that. Here's the Three Kingdoms area, or era. Excuse me. Um, when the Korean Peninsula was divided into the Buryeo, Pekche, and Shilla tribal kingdoms, which were engaged in territorial wars, regional antagonism became intensified when King Kong, Wang Kong, the founder of the Buryeo Dynasty. We started here, 1918, followed a bitter struggle and defeated Pekche. After his consolidated power on the peninsula, he prohibited the hiring of people from the territory of later Pekche. In his ten injunctions, his ten main laws, he called this area a perverse and rebellious land. The open policy of discrimination against people from this region continued throughout the dynasty and has become deeply entrenched in the psyche of the Korean people. So this is how a stereotype is carried on. You know, we talk about, I summarized all the different frameworks of stratification, and one of them was ideology. And you know, ideology can stratify people as hard as color differences, as hard as class, and you know, just the assumptions about people without even knowing them. Label people. As in more recent years, the regional antagonism was intensified as a result of the military rule, um, both of which came from one region, the Yonghan area, which used to be part of the Shia dynasty. Many of the ruling elites of the two military regimes came from one region, and as a result, people from other regions felt they were receiving favored treatment. So when you think about the dictatorships in Korea, there's a spatial element to its ratification. And every presidential election so far has never been able to remove this quality. They just remove the location. You have Kim Dae-jung coming from that area of what, Chona, you know, Jolado. And the same thing happened. It just filled the region with his supporters. Now President Lee, it's filled with Gyeongsang people. Oh, I mean, it's really filled, very strongly filled. So this causes a difficulty for a national identity. So even if Koreans believe that they're Koreans, political structures encourage those divisions. There are very few examples of elections in Korea where there are even support for different candidates. You tend to have one region 95% supporting one candidate and the other region 5%. And it follows the hometown man, typically man, within Korea. So that's the historical aspect. Here's the regional elections, December of 1987, presidential election. 92% of the votes in the Yongnam region went to two candidates of Yongnam, Rote Wu and Kim Yong Sang. On the other hand, 89% of Jolado Honam votes went to Kim Dae Jung, the favorite son of that region. And April 1988, the National Assembly election was pretty much a regional contest. In that election, candidates of uh, Rote Wu, Kim Young Sum's party won 63, 63 of the 66 seats in one region. That's why it's so contentious. Political culture in Korea is so contentious because there's no compromises. There's no geopolitical compromises. Space is very stratified. And this continues into the national, the so called national government. It's really multi regional government fighting each other. There are very few national parties. Who's the only president that tried to do that? That was the now dead President Crow. Uh, he, he attempted in his early career to come from one region. He supported and put all people, but he tried to make the government of different regions, and that made everybody mad. And that lost a lot of his support. It had a lot to do with other things, but he was the first president to try to do a national government and to balance within the government different regional politics. It didn't work. It didn't work. Um, his own region rejected him and fought as hard against him as any other. 